I'm George Weigel, the author of Witness to Hope and the End and the Beginning, both published in new Polish editions by Wydrodza, the publishing house of the Order of Preachers, Polish province, the Polish Dominicans, to whom I am very grateful and for whom I am happy to be speaking to you today. It's been 19 years, almost 20 years, since the death of Pope St. John Paul II. For young people today, the Pope is at best a distant memory. This is unfortunate because the achievement of John Paul II uh, is an enduring one, which I believe has set the course for a living Catholic Church in the 21st century and the third millennium. And I think we can get some idea of how large that achievement was by going back and remembering something about what the church was like in 1978. So let's begin there. What was the Catholic situation on October 16, 1978, when John Paul II was elected? Uh, first. The Second Vatican Council, which was the most important Catholic event in 500 years, was undigested. There was a tremendous argument throughout the world church about what Vatican II meant, what it intended to do, and how it should be implemented. One camp in this argument uh, argued that the Council has to be understood in continuity with the Church's 2,000-year-old tradition. Another camp argued that Vatican II was essentially an invitation to reinvent the Catholic Church. And the argument between these two camps, between 1965 and 1978, had become quite embittered and not a little paralyzing of the Church's work. The Church had endured two cultural tsunamis, two cultural hurricanes, in the years immediately after Vatican II, between 1965 and 1978. The, cult, the sexual revolution uh, built around the oral contraceptive pill had uh, swarmed over the Western world creating a whole new set of questions about how we should live together. And politics had come unhinged throughout much of Western Europe and the United States beginning in the year 1968. Politics on the eastern side of what we used to call the Iron Curtain was not in much better shape. Communist tyranny still prevailed throughout Central and Eastern Europe. And the church's attempt to address that through what was known as the Vatican's Ostpolitik, or Eastern policy, had been a failure. Uh, the church's attempt to reach agreement with communist regimes had not resulted in more freedom for the church. It had resulted in the demoralization of the church uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Then there was the crisis of the priesthood. Uh, the years between 1965 and 1978 saw the greatest exodus from the Catholic priesthood since the reformations of the 16th century. Uh, many institutes of religious life, orders of priests and nuns and brothers, had gotten detached from the meaning of the vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience, and were in deep trouble. And we now know, in retrospect, there had been an intensification of clerical sexual abuse, in, in large part because of the breakdown of discipline within seminaries and uh, religious communities. All of this had led to a demoralized church. The church of 1978 was not full of energy, it was demoralized. And many sectors of the world church seem to have little or no capacity to either propose the gospel or to shape world affairs at a fragile moment in human history. 
over 9,665 days from October 16, 1978 to April 2, 2005, John Paul II addressed and in many instances reversed this post-conciliar drift into ecclesiastical incoherence and Catholic irrelevance on the world stage. That reversal began on October 22nd, when at his inaugural mass, the Pope boldly proclaimed, be not afraid, open the doors to Christ. Christ back at the center, the church's proclamation of Christ boldly, unapologetically, the church's proclamation of Christ as the answer to the question that is every human life rang out from St. Peter's Square on October 22, 1978, and sent a great bolt of energy throughout the world church. A French writer, André Fressard, uh, wrote a story for his Paris newspaper about that day in which he said, I think quite accurately, if metaphorically, this is not a pope from Poland, this is a pope from Galilee. This is a pope who is going to energize the world church as the original apostolic band had energized the church in the Acts of the Apostles. Over 26 and a half years, John Paul II urged 1.2 billion Catholics to become missionary disciples, teaching that each of us received a vocation to be a missionary of Christ on the day of our baptism, and that everywhere we go is mission territory. Mission territory is not just exotic parts of the world where brave men and women go to bring the gospel for the first time. Mission territory, John Paul II taught, is your kitchen table, it's your neighborhood, it's your workplace, it's your life as a consumer, it's your life as a citizen, it's your life in the family. All of this is mission territory. In doing so, John Paul II called the church to what he described as the new evangelization, a church that had rediscovered the missionary impulse that it had received from the Lord himself when he said, go and make disciples of all nations, and which the church had been empowered to do by the descent of the Holy Spirit at the first Pentecost. That's worth pausing on for just a moment. What happened on that first Christian Pentecost? There's this tremendous experience of the Holy Spirit described in the Acts of the Apostles as tongues of fire, but then what happens? That original band of Christians, the Apostles and Our Lady, they didn't sit there and say, wow, that was great, can we do that again? No, they went out, as the book of Acts continues, and became great missionaries. That's a paradigm for the church throughout the world, throughout history. John Paul II understood that the 20th century, two world wars, three totalitarian systems, oceans of blood, mountains of corpses, Gulag, Auschwitz, Ukrainian Holodomor, terror in China, 20 million people starved to death. All of this had torn great holes had shredded the moral fabric of humanity. In lifting up St. Faustina Kowalska and the Divine Mercy devotion before the World Church, in, ca in canonizing Faustina as the first saint of the third millennium, John Paul II was offering the world the adequate medicine for its pain. All of that pain, all of that suffering, could only be healed by an experience of the divine mercy. John Paul II understood that the sexual revolution had also done great damage to the human condition. 
And in a series of 129 remarkable audience addresses, speaking to crowds in Rome, between 1979 and 1984, John Paul II articulated what we call now the theology of the body, which is the most extraordinary Christian response to the sexual revolution that has ever been articulated. And in the places in the world church where the theology of the body has been pondered and worked into catechetical and pastoral materials, Marriage preparation programs have been re-energized. Catechetical programs have been deepened. And the people of the church now have a body of thought that is an answer to the challenges posed by the sexual revolution. John Paul II also renovated the moral theology of the church in a broader sense with the encyclical Veritatis Splendor of 1993. By reminding the church in the world that there are some things that are just gravely evil, period. Most normal human beings understand this to be the case. In what possible circumstance would rape be less than a grave evil, or murder, or the torture of children. And yet there were theologians in the church in 1978 who were saying, well, there really is no such thing as an intrinsically evil act. The moral life is a negotiation between intentions, act, consequences, and what really counts is your fundamental orientation in life, not your individual acts. In the encyclical Veritatis Splendor, John Paul II said that drives all of the drama out of the human condition. Our acts count because we count. If we are somebodies with an innate dignity and value and an eternal destiny, then what we do here and now means something. And to deny that is to dehumanize ourselves and the world. John Paul II was a great reformer of the Catholic priesthood. As I mentioned a moment ago, there had been enormous defections from the priesthood in the 1960s, 70s, and that was reversed under John Paul II. John Paul II initiated a great program of reform in seminaries in the formation of Catholic priests, and he inspired a tremendous number of vocations throughout the world church. John Paul II was also an inspiration for what has now become, in the early 21st century, the greatest sphere of Christian and Catholic growth in the world the church in sub-Saharan Africa. By the end of the 21st century, perhaps even earlier, Catholicism in sub-Saharan Africa will be the demographic center of the world church. That process had begun before John Paul II, but it was immensely accelerated by his intense interest in Africa, by his dozen pastoral pilgrimages to Africa, by his inspiring the new evangelization in Africa, by his lifting up African churchmen to, posi to positions of responsibility in Rome, and by lifting up before the whole world church, uh, the African church, which was living a kind of New Testament experience. One of the men that John Paul II brought to Rome, Cardinal Francis Arinze, had baptized his own parents. He was a first-generation Christian. The vitality, the joy, the enthusiasm of African Catholicism, John Paul II believed, could help renovate 
the church throughout the world. So, a great reformer of the church, but the Pope also had an extraordinary impact on world affairs. As I have been writing for over two decades, the beginning of the end of European communism came on June 2nd, 1979, when John Paul II got off the plane in Warsaw and kissed the ground. Over nine days, between June 2nd and June 10th, 1979, John Paul II ignited a revolution of conscience throughout East Central Europe, a revolution of people determined to live in the truth, what Father Joseph Tischner called a great forest planted by aroused consciences that created over 10 hard years the Solidarity Revolution that led the way to the collapse of communism in Central and Eastern Europe in the revolutions of 1989 and eventually to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. That all of this was done without mass violence was astonishing. The 20th century's normal mode of effecting great social change was mass murder. This was different. There was no such mass violence, and that was because there had been, beneath and within the political revolution, a revolution of conscience launched by John Paul II. John Paul II gave a new and developed articulation of the social doctrine of the Catholic Church for a world after the Cold War, emphasizing that freedom is not a matter of doing what I like, but freedom is a matter of freely choosing the good and doing that as a matter of moral habit. John Paul II addressed the fundamental crisis of the 20th century. Who are we? Where did we come from? What is our destiny? Are we merely congealed stardust? Is humanity just the happy accident, the byproduct of random cosmic biochemical forces? Or is there a built-in nobility and dignity that if we own allows us to build the free and virtuous society of the future? John Paul II addressed that great question by posing Jesus Christ as the answer to the question that is every human life. Christ reveals not only the face of the merciful Father, the divine mercy that heals the wounds of a deeply wounded humanity, Jesus Christ reveals the truth about who we are and what our noble and eternal destiny is. There are so many other things that could be said about the achievement of John Paul II, his renovation of the dialogue between Catholicism and its religious parent, Judaism, his astonishing trip to the Holy Land in March of 2000, in which he reminded the church and the world that Christianity is not a myth, it's not a fable, it's not a fairy tale, Christianity begins with real men and women in a real place at a certain point in time who were so transformed by their experience of Jesus, the rabbi from Nazareth, Jesus, the risen Lord, that they went out and transformed the world. That's the root of Christianity. Christianity is deeply embedded in history. That's what John Paul II reminded the world in March 2000. On the day John Paul II died, I was in the main studio of NBC News in New York with the anchorman Brian Williams. And after Mr. Williams and I had spoken for a few moments about my experience of John Paul II, we began to speak with major figures in American public life. And the first one we spoke to 
was Henry Kissinger. And Dr. Kissinger, who is not a Catholic, not a particularly religious man, but a great student of modern history, said simply, John Paul II was the emblematic figure of the second half of the 20th century. No one's life and accomplishment more summed up the human drama of the second half of the 20th century than John Paul II. That was an extraordinary testimony. I think it still remains the truth, but to that testimony, I would add, John Paul II was able to be that because he was a radically converted disciple of Jesus Christ. Everything in his life, his entire accomplishment, grew out of his discipleship. And that itself is an important lesson for the 21st century, how deep Catholic conviction, deep Christian conviction, can bend the curve of history in a more humane direction. Thank you.